everybody, we are going to continue talking about our ecosystems and biomes unit. We're going to look at things that cause disturbances to ecosystems and how they're able to bounce back and how that all ties into evolution. So we are going to be starting with natural disruptions to ecosystems, okay? And what this first image is showing you are the different types of spheres we have on the planet. And you guys know what these mean. So if you look right here, the first one we have is, hold on, my computer's frozen a little bit. There we go. The hydrosphere, that's all the water. The geosphere, that's all the land. Atmosphere, obviously, is the air. And then the biosphere are all of the living components on the planet. All of these are interacting on a constant basis. So we say that there is constant interaction between the spheres. Okay. There are inputs and outputs going both ways. Um, and I know that you guys could come up with lots of examples of how they are interacting specifically. So <clears throat> when we have a disruption to an ecosystem, and I'm talking about things like hurricanes, um, tornadoes, droughts, fires, some ecosystems are able to bounce back easier than other ones. And I know that I told you guys that deserts are very fragile and they're not able to bounce back very easily. And that's because deserts have pretty low biodiversity. So the more biodiverse an ecosystem is, the easier it is able to bounce back from a disturbance. Okay, so ecosystems with greater biodiversity are able to bounce back or recover faster. All right. Um, now, these disruptions to ecosystems, they can be um, episodic, meaning that we know that this is going to happen at the same time every single year. They could be completely random, like we see with uh, tornadoes and hurricanes. Or they could be periodic, meaning that they're going to occur quite frequently. And um, what we see from this is it can cause large amounts of habitat change, which is then also going to be one of the driving factors behind um, evolution. So the last thing we're going to write down right here is it causes... Large amounts of habitat change. Okay, so let's scoot down here to look at these two pictures. Okay, so when we look at things that are um, occurring right now, we know that we're seeing a dramatic increase in the rise of sea levels. So if you look at this picture right here, this is sea level history. And yes, we have had fluctuations throughout, um, throughout time. So this is thousands of years before present day. Yes, there have been lots of fluctuations. But right here, you see this is the last glacial right here. So this is going to be the ice age. What have our ocean levels continued to do? they are continuing to increase. And we know that this is directly from climate change because the ice caps and the glaciers are melting. So climate change. All right. Now this is also going to be um, another sea level measurement. Okay. So as I said right here, it has varied. Okay. But you can see consistently this is from 1930 to 2010, so this is a much more close-up view of what's happening. 
it has been steadily increasing. So sea levels have varied due to natural and man-made causes. All right, so as I said, these disruptions to ecosystems can be short-term or long-term. So when we see, let's look at the, uh, the short-term first, okay? Short-term are going to be quick events. And um, what we look for here is something called an indicator species. Okay, an indicator species is an organism that is not typically present in that ecosystem, okay? It shouldn't be there. So here's two ways to look at it. If this indicator species um, shows up in an ecosystem, something's going on, okay? Now the flip side of that is if there is an organism that is usually present in that ecosystem and it vanishes, that would also be an indicator species because it's supposed to be there. Why is it gone? That's telling you something is happening to the environment. So really good examples of indicator species are birds and fish because they have to have pretty specific conditions to live in, specifically temperature. So if you see them vanish or show up all of a sudden, that is an indication that something is going on with the ecosystem. Okay, so um, long-term damage, we refer to this as sustained, meaning that it may not recover. So Let's go down here and look at biodiversity. Now we know that biodiversity is going to be the different uh, amounts of life within an ecosystem. How many animals, how many plants. So the more variety there is, the more diversity there is, the higher the biodiversity. Biodiversity is a result of evolution. And the reason is when you have organisms like plants and animals living in an ecosystem, they have to adapt specific ways in order to survive within that ecosystem. Um, if it's too hot, they're not gonna live there. If it's too cold, they're not gonna live there. It also depends on their food source, how much sunlight is available, how much water is available. So all of these things are going to be leading into biodiversity. Okay. So we can look at biodiversity at three different levels. So we have right here what's called ecosystem diversity. So this right here, this is going to be the different biomes on the planet. And we just talked about the different biomes. So you could give me lots of different examples of these right now. Now, when we zoom in a little bit into a specific biome, such as a forest right here, we have species diversity. So this is going to be the variety of species, okay? So more species we have better recovery. Remember, we want the ecosystem to be able to bounce back very quickly from a disturbance, okay? Now, we're gonna go to the micro level, which is genetic diversity. So we call this the micro level because this is the actual genes, this is the DNA. So if you have a population, and this is what, squirrels, chipmunks maybe? Can't really tell from the picture. Um, the more genetically diverse a population is, the better it is able to withstand stress from the environment. If you have a particular uh, species in an ecosystem and there's only 
one or two different types of genes, they are extremely vulnerable to being wiped out completely. And we don't want to have extinction happen. So the more genetically diverse the population is, the better it can respond to stressors. Now, let's look at this example that I have up here. We have community one, community two, and you can see there are four different types of trees within this community. So we have A, B, C, and D. Now, when we look at biodiversity, okay, you can see that in this first picture, we have 25% of each type of tree. So in this community, we say that this is species even. It's the same amount, okay? When we look at community two, we can see that tree type A is extremely abundant. And the remaining tree types are very sparse. So when we look at this image, um, and we ask the question, well, which one of these communities is more biodiverse? Yeah, they both have four different types of trees, but this one has a greater distribution or evenness of the different types. So this would be more biodiverse. Okay. All right, now when we look at the organisms that live inside, these biomes. We categorize them as being a generalist or a specialist. And so we're going to pull on some vocabulary that we learned about um, in Unit 2, I believe. So a generalist versus a specialist. A generalist is an organism that can pretty much survive anywhere you put it. Um, it doesn't have very special requirements. Um, it's able to withstand a lot of different conditions. A specialist is going to be a, an organism that requires very specific living conditions. So, <clears throat> um, a generalist, we say, has um, an advantage in ecosystems that are changing. Okay, a specialist has an advantage in ecosystems that are constant. Well, why is it not writing now? Let's try this again that are, there we go, that are constant. Okay, so <clears throat> when we look at the terms um, R and K strategists, do you guys remember these? Where R's have lots of babies, K's have very few, and there's a difference in parental care. So when we look at um, a generalist, animals that can survive lots of different kinds of of situations, we say that these are the R strategists. Okay? And then the ones that are specialists are probably going to be more likely as the K strategists because you can't take a polar bear and drop him off in the savanna, or you can't take a lion and drop him off in the tundra. So those would be examples of specialists. Okay. So we are going to look at, in the next set of notes, um, some specific concepts within evolution itself.